Good morning. So I'm yours for the next two days, right? Five units. We have five units of 90 minutes each. Okay. My name is Günther Blöschel. I'm an Austrian a hydrologist. And I, I, I studied civil engineering in Austria, hydrology, water, water management. Then I spent some time in Australia, and then I went back to Austria. And um, I'm doing research on floods and droughts, water management, hydrological modeling, and sociohydrology. That's why I'm here. I'm really happy to be here. And, and I can see in your faces that you're interested in the topic. So you're, you prefer this over a coffee in the coffee shop? That's good, me too. And I'd like to have a round of introduction. We are here like 20 people, and in the two other campuses, 10, 10 people each. I'd like to hear your name and uh, your, your background, whether it's civil engineering or environmental engineering or geology or something else. OK? And can we start with here? So we are a total of 35 people, so rather quick. Hi, my name is Cesar. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Cesar. I'm sanitary and environmental engineering, and I'm a master's degree student here. Very good. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bruno. I'm a civil engineer, and I'm also a master student here. Good. Just, yeah. Hi, my name is Yuri, and I am a civil engineer, and I'm also a master degree student. Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning. I am Susana Montenegro. I am a civil engineer, and I am a professor at the Federal University of Pernambuco, a hydrologist. Good morning to you all. Oh, sorry. Uh, I am Mario, a water resources engineer, and also a professor at the uh, San Carlos School of Engineering here in this campus. Hi, my name is Felipe. I'm a civil engineer by training. And now I'm a PhD candidate here at the uh, University of Sao Paulo. Hi, my name is Cristiane, and I am a civil engineer and a master student here, too. Hi, my name is Tassiana. I am an environmental engineer. Hi, my name is Talita. I am an environmental engineer, too, and I am a master student. Good morning, my name is Karen, and I am civil engineering and also a master's student here. Very good. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marina. I'm an environmental engineering and I'm a PhD candidate. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose, Mama, Jose Mamani. I am a PhD student. PhD student in civil engineering? Z. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ilma, and I'm environmental engineer and master student here. Hi, my name is Paula. I'm a civil engineering and master student too. Hi, my name is Gabriel. I'm a civil engineer, and I also did a double degree, so I'm a general, generalistic engineer, and I'm a master student too. Morning, my name is Eric, and I'm a civil engineer. Uh, doing my PhD degree. PhD. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alex, and I'm a civil engineer, and also I'm a master degree student. Good morning, my name is André, and I'm, I am a civil engineer and a master student also. My name is Julian, and I am an environmental engineer and PhD student here. My name is Gabriela, I'm an environmental engineer and I'm a PhD candidate. Hi, my name is Lisette, I am a culture engineer, also I'm a student degree, I'm a master's student. Thank you very much. Can we get the other two campuses to introduce themselves, is this possible? Uh, ah, sorry. 
Alfredo é, Francini, será que os candidatos aí podem se apresentar rapidamente, o nome e a formação? Para todos aqui também saberem quem está aí. Chegando perto do microfone, pode ser? Alfredo? Pode ser? Ok. Começamos então com Pernambuco. Okay. Univers Federal University of Pernambuco. Você está me ouvindo bem? Não, não, nós, tá não, não está ouvindo, não está ouvindo. Então tem que ser mais perto do microfone. Está me ouvindo, Mário? Está ouvindo você? Estou vendo você, mas não estou ouvindo as pessoas. Tem que ser mais perto, viu? Oh. Tem que ser do lado do computador. Não, não, não dá para ouvir. There is a delay in the YouTube connection, so between. Okay. So they will listen. They will. É, não, eu próximo aqui. Pode fazer um teste. Okay. 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 So, and they will listen. Okay. So, so they will listen and So, mainly civil and environmental engineers. So, in what way are engineers different from other water scientists? To, to, according to me, two main things. What stands out, what you have learned or are learning relative to geologists or social scientists or metrologists, biologists? What are your two main strengths, I believe? What would you think? Two main strengths. There may be more. So, what do you think I, you are good in? Better than maybe a biologist? Calculations. Calculations. You love mathematics, yeah. right? Because engineering is quantitative. You want to demonstrate things, right? OK, you are quantitative. Second thing. Ah, you need the micro. No, 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 just the Ah. Uh, for me, okay. <laughs> second thing. What's the second thing you're good at? Logics. 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 I'm sure you're good in logics, yes. Anything else? Okay, what, what I think you're good in. We all engineers are good in. I'm an engineer as well. What you're doing should work. You should not only, you're not only talking about things. What we're doing will work, needs to work. It's important to us that the things work. We're not just blah, 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 but what we do will function. Okay, these are two main things, quantitative and things will work, which is different from social scientists, for example. They are not quantitative, well, they are very nice people, but they're certainly not quantitative and they can talk forever with any concrete outcome. Okay, because now we're talking about sociohydrology. Okay. Now, uh, our, this course will be interactive. I will talk 50% of the time. You will talk 50% of the time. I hope. That's the plan, <laughs> right? So just adjust yourself to that. I really expect you to talk and contribute to the discussion. And we'll steer the discussion. And we start with sociohydrology. And I'll, um, there will be a, a talk in the afternoon where I have a PowerPoint presentation for a bigger audience. We'll probably also be there and uh, we'll show some nice slides. But now, briefly, have you read this paper? This, have you all read this paper or not? Okay, main message, what's the main message? Oh, you already need to start talking, yes? You can see. What's the main message of that paper, please? Hey, there's a conclusion section, it's a full page. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Somebody must start, right? Please. No, not you. Okay. Who else? They are a bit shy. Come on, people. Yeah, I understand that. Still, that's why we're here. You're not here only to listen, but also to talk. Both ways. It's two ways feedbacks, correct? Yeah. See, two ways feedbacks? Yeah. This? So anything related to this? Two ways feedbacks? So, what kind of two-way feedbacks are we talking here in this paper? Why is it called sociohydrology? What is hydrology? Did anybody have a hydrology course in this room? Yeah. Everybody? Yeah. Good. What is hydrology? It's a science that studies how the water can behave in society. Yeah. And Exactly, the science of fresh water. And engineering hydrology, is it different from hydrology? No. No? Well, there are two differences. We are quantitative, we just don't only talk, we have calculations. And we want to things work. We design structures, we want to look at the effect of climate change or land use change, and we'll see how much water we can extract from the well, and we need a number for that. Two cubic meters per day, or 2,000 cubic meters per day makes a difference. Okay? Okay. Hydrology. And what is socio? Includes. Includes people in the process of decision and modeling as well. Includes information from people as well, I think. Very good. So, socio is about people. None of us are sociologists or psychologists, but we all have to do with people, right? Every day with lots of people. And people behave differently. You have know, some people this way. And usually there's, there's a difference between psychology and sociology. Psychology is about how individual people behave. And sociology is how groups of people behave. Okay, that's the difference. And sociology is about how people behave, how the water behaves, and the interactions of that. Okay? Now, Main message of this paper. We're still not there. I'm still waiting for the main message. Yeah, don't cheat. Don't look at the abstract. <laughs> yes, it's okay to look at the abstract. <laughs> this, the main message is usually towards the end of the abstract. Very true. Okay? I can assure you it's going to be even more interactive one than what you think. I will make you come out and draw on the whiteboard. <laughs> you will be surprised how interactive that gets. That's how I teach my students in, in master and PhD classes. Not in undergraduate, of course. Undergraduate are just lecture. But if we have this size of group, students need to work. You're here not just for listening. Okay, main message. Okay, main message. Uh, for what I understood, it's like to use that information from people, from society, to improve uh, long-term predictions and to first not uh, make their participation easier in this process of uh, prediction. For me, that's the main idea. I don't know if it's all. I think, you, I think you've heard it very well. If we want to do long-term water management, 
we need to account for the feedbacks between people and water. If it's short term, it doesn't matter so much. Right? Short term, what are the interaction of people and water? What is the interaction, what is the effect of water on people? What is the effect of water on people? You understand the effect? One way, effect of water on people. One way effect. There are a number of effects. In terms of floods, there's a flood and the water damages our infrastructure. It's an effect of water on people. There's a drought and the crops die. Yeah, there can be people stay hungry. Effect of water on people. What about the effects of people on water? What is such an effect? Uh, pollution, scarcity. Pollution, yes. One effect of, of, of people on water is pollution. You have the, the, the wastewater goes into the groundwater, then it's polluted, nitrate levels go up, or heavy metals, it's polluted, we can no longer use it. Another effect of people on water. If you build a levee, you know, a levee is a dam at the side of a river. If you build a levee along a river, you will constrain the floodplain and the floods downstream will go up. It's an effect of people on water. If you extract water from the streams, what will happen? The discharges will go down. It's an effect of people on water. Last week I was in China, I spent a week in China, in Nanjing and Beijing, and they were telling me about changes in the hydrology in China. And there's a river in the middle of China which is called the Yellow River, and the discharges went down in the past 30 years by 50%. And this was not climate change. It was people extracting water, a lot of water, 1,000 cubic meters per second out of that river for irrigation. It's an effect of people on water. So, Water affects people, people affect water. And then if we extract water from the stream, there's less discharge. This will also again affect people, downstream people. They have not enough water. Right? And if we pollute the water, it will also have an effect of people. So there's a two-way feedback. People affect water, water affect people. Okay. In the past, people have not accounted for that. They only looked at one-way interaction, one effect. And if it's a short-term planning, that's okay. But if it's long-term, we need to go both ways. Water, people, water, people, water, people, water. Okay, a feedback. So conceptually, that's not very hard to understand. But we want to look at it in a quantitative way. And that's why we have this paper, which Siva and myself have written a couple of years ago. We try to do this in a quantitative way. And we can, can you bring up the, f the f can you bring up this paper? So we can have the first slide. We go through the figures of this paper. Just the first figure, yeah, maybe full screen, and then, uh, yeah, and sc uh, scroll down, please. Okay, top left, and can you zoom in? So it's the full, full, full screen. This picture. Okay. You saw this picture. Did anybody not understand this picture? <laughs> it's not a nice question, right? <laughs> Did anybody not understand this picture? Did anybody understand this picture? Uh. <laughs> okay, you did not. What is on the horizontal axis? What does the horizontal axis show? So you had your mathematics, right? You know what a Fourier transform is? You know. So what is frequency? What is a power spectrum? A power spectrum Have you walk no no, I need you no know, have you other other colours maybe? Here, ah, red is very good. Okay. And the camera is there. Yeah. Okay. So on the horizontal axis, it says frequency. It's like, a, like has to do with wavelength, 
you know, wavelength of light, of, of sound. In a high frequency would be a high pitch, and low frequency would be <laughs> low pitch. High frequency would be blue light. Low frequency would be what color light? <laughs> What's the low frequency light in the light spectrum? Red, right? Red. So, and then the power tells us what proportion of the frequencies there are in the entire spectrum. What is more important? Is the low frequency more important or the high frequency important? When we have a signal that looks like this, the response of y as a function of time would look like this. But this signal, low frequency, looks like this. OK? That's a spectrum. And of course, you can write down the equations, but the schematic just does as, does as well. We need to watch the caps here. OK, so this is the frequency we're explaining here. And what does this say? say? They say, in the past, we had a separation of scales. There were slow processes. For example, land use change, forestation, afforestation over hundreds of years, which is this part. This is red line shows slow process, or geology, or landscape evolution or changing cultures, changing societies, which is this, low, a low thing, like the green line here. And a fast process, for example, hydrological response. There is a flood, and the response takes a couple of hours, high frequency, fast process, the red ones, in the past. But now, we have a mix of these fast and slow processes and interactions. So the new line is this top dotted line, we both have slow processes and fast processes, and they go together. They're mixed. And because of this, we need to look at the interactions of slow and fast processes. For example, climate change. It mixes fast processes, like a flood, with slow processes. Climatic variability uh, changes in the ocean temperatures. Let's give you, give you an example of that for hydrology. Floods. So I, I'll do a lot of research on floods. Okay. Flood is a fast process when you do flood frequency analysis. You know what flood frequency analysis is? No? Okay. They, they, no, no. Don't look. <laughs> My students. <right? laughs> You're free to say if you don't know something, right? I really like you to be honest. I'm not going to mock you. <laughs> flood frequency. What we do in engineering, in engineering hydrology, we look at the discharges of a river, how much water there is in a river. For example, when there is a lot of water, when it rains, then the water levels will increase. And the discharge will increase. The unit of discharge is, what's the unit of discharge? The units of discharge of a stream flow. What is it? Cubic meters per second, exactly. We're talking about cubic meters per second, discharge, exactly. And then we take the biggest discharge in any one year. The biggest discharge. For the Amazon, it will be 300,000 cubic meters per second, biggest river in the world, right? 300,000. Smallest discharge of the Amazon, there's always a lot of water. 100,000 cubic meters per, per year, right? So we take the biggest discharge in every year, and then we, from that we construct a frequency distribution, like a histogram. How frequent is that the discharge is exceeded in any year? Let the flood frequency curve. Okay. Now, that's a fast process. Every year, there is a dis many maximum annual discharge. And we use this flood frequency curve for designing infrastructure. It's quantitative. Inf we're engineers. And we want to think to work, because we then know exactly the probability with which is a discharge is exceeded. And we can also estimate that the failure probability of the dam, or the levee, or the culvert, or whatever we're doing, right? Quantitative and want things to work. Two things, right? Our two faces. Okay, now this is a fast process. And then a slow process would be climatic evolution, ice ages 10,000 years ago, or landscape evolution 10,000 of years, slow process. This was in the past, but now 
with climate change and rapid land use change, we also have intermediate changes of tens of years. The flood probabilities are changing. They go up or they go down, right? This is the intermediate thing. We now look at, need to look at the interaction of the fast and the slow processes. Climate change and floods, for example. Okay? Next, next figure, please. Ah, coevolution. What is co That's a nice term. So on the left hand side, on the left hand side, you see this diagram where you have a slow process, could for landform evolution or societal evolution. Societies, cultures come and go. I will. Uh, this afternoon, we'll give an example of the ancient Mayas in Central America, or the, the Roman civilizations. They come and go after hundreds and hundreds of years, and then there are fast processes, like floods events, or if, um, uh, seasonal variability of, of water. Monsoon, for example, it's fast variability. Now, the coevolution idea. Anybody would like to comment what coevolution is? What is coevolution? I give you an example from your daily life what coevolution is, right? From psychology. <laughs> Consider yourself as a person and your partner or a friend, right? Two people, one person and their partners. Over years, I've been married for 35 years, so it's a long time to look back, right? And you may be together for a shorter time, probably. There is a fast signal. You're going out for lunch, and you quarrel, or you may not quarrel, right? You interact, that's the fast process. Every day you do something together. You call your partner on the phone. That's a fast process. Slow process, you change your character. You become more, you become wiser, for example, or more relaxed, or more aggressive, hopefully not. The character of a person changes over the years. I'm a quite different person from what I was at your age, and you will be very different in 30 years from now. That's a slow process. And the fast process and the slow processes, they interact, right? Your decision, whether you go to dinner, or take your button out for dinner or not, will depend on your character. But also, when you go out for dinner, it will have a small effect on your character. You, you'll, you'll share stories and we'll discuss politics, about the purpose of life, all sorts of things. During dinner, fast process, will have a small, a minute effect on your character. And character, and just the long-term traces of your character over the, it's the, the red line, the slow process, okay? One person. Now let's consider two persons, you and your partner. It's a couple system. It's a couple system. Both short term and long term. Your short term, your short term variability, your short term effects, you know, eating and talking, will in effect of the short term effect of your partner. When you quarrel, there will be an immediate response, of course, right? Or if you share jokes, short term. But also, the long term things are coupled. So there are three, there are four units. Your short-term variability, your partner's short-term variability. Your long-term variability character, your partner's variability, they're coupled, they hang together, okay? That's the story of coevolution. And you can imagine the similar thing for hydrology and landscape and climate, okay? That's more trivial. And let's now look at the equation. Equation number one. Can you find equation number one for me? Couplic. We are Quantitative. Now, something very simple for. for um, no, no, I wanted to direct the example. Yes, this, that's the one. Two, equation two. We can go direct to equation two. Okay. Now we are playing sociologists. We are pretending to be sociologists, engineering sociologists. So it's okay to use equations. Now you remember this four-body system, you a four-entity system. You and your partner, slow and fast, okay? Now let's couple that. Equation two. Uh, no, that's not the one. 
Uh, I don't remember. Maybe further up. Yeah, that's the one. 2A and 2B. Okay, this equation. There's a fast process and a slow process. The first equation represents the fast processes. The second equation, the slow processes. You are x and your partner is y. Okay? Do you understand differential equations? You do, right? What is a differential equation? In what way is a differential equation different from an algebraic equation? The opposite of differential equation is algebraic equation. What's the difference? Why is it called differential equation? What's a differential equation? <laughs> it has variation in time. Uh, it can have variations in time, but this is not what defines a differential equation. Differential equation can be in time, doesn't have to be time, but also algebraic equation can vary in time. Right? But what is different in a differential equation from an algebraic equation? Okay, look at these equations. They're differential equations. In what way are they different from... I, I don't know how to say this in English, but it has a, a derived... It has a differential. That's why it's called a differential equation. It's called a derivative. It's called a derivative. On the left-hand side, it's a derivative of the variable x, which is the dependent variable, as a function of time. It, this derivative tells us how fast does x change with time. It's a derivative. And an equation that has a derivative is called a differential equation. Not surprisingly. Okay. Now, our example with you and your partner, with your daily course and your character, your daily behavior and your character, long-term behavior, what would be x, big x, small x, Big Y, small Y. Okay, I would like to map the example I gave you about yourself and your partner to this equation. Can, you, can, we, repre can we represent your behavior by this equation or not? Yes, we can. How? How can we? We have four entities. Your Daily behavior, your character. Your partner's daily behavior, your partner's character. And we have four variables here. Which is what? Hmm? Uh, it's uh, how much each one changing time. The difference, the difference between each time, each step, each stage, I don't know. Um, and this is already quite a specific equation. We can write this actually, that you can write this in more general terms. But here it says the fast equation is, you, know, you can combine these four variables in different ways. But in, in this equation will tell us, x is u. Small x is your fast behavior. And, and big X is your slow behavior, your character. And this equation tells us your change in your fast behavior is a function of your fast behavior, A is a coefficient, and the character of your partner. And the second equation tells us the character of the partner changes with time according to your own behavior, what you talk during dinner, and the character of the partner. And A, B, C, D are coefficients. And the sigma is written as a stochastic equation. We're allowing for some random noise. You don't need that. If you re remove that, you get a deterministic equation. OK? So this can represent this coupling of fast and slow processes of two people. And here it is not for the two people, because I'm not a sociologist, but this is for Water and erosion. So the one thing is the runoff, which is the fast processes, and the slow processes, the landscape evolution. 
Okay. Now, this in, in mathematical sociology, it's a classical problem. And um, this is the, and it's called the problem of Romeo and Juliet. I'm not sure what this in Brazilian is, but Romeo and Juliet, what is it in Brazilian? Okay, Romeo and Juliet. Okay, you know the, but the, you know the, the, the story of Shakespeare and Shakespeare borrowed it from someone someone else. He did not invent it actually. They just in those days, he just borrowed from lots of generations of, of um, writers. So two people, and then you can write the relationship of these two people exactly the same way, with A, B, C different coefficients. So. And the A, B, C, D represent what the effect of Romeo's behavior on Juliet's behavior is, short term and long term. And then depending on what they are, for example, if the love of, if the, listen, if, if the love of Rome, Romeo increases, the love of Juliet will increase or decrease depending on whether the coefficient is positive or negative. And vice versa is the other way around. Okay. Now, when you solve this system of equations, you can, you get, it's a linear, it's, it's a system of coupled linear differential equations, right? And it looks similar if they were algebraic equations, it would be really simple. simple. You would have two lines, and you can have three solutions, right? Yeah. One point, no solution, or an infinity of solutions, which is two lines. But because it's differential equations, it's more interesting. Differential equations are more difficult to integrate, right? You can have solutions. You can have an equilibrium, so a stable solution. So it varies with time, but in, in, at the equilibrium, in, for in time infinity, if they retire, Romeo and Juliet, it will be stable, which means happy marriage. Second solution, it will explode. And this is also what I have for the soils. Can we get the figure? The blue and blue and brown figure. No, the next figure probably. There we go. So second solution, depending on how the coefficients are, it depends on the eigenvalues of the of these coefficients. It will explode. What will happen? They will break apart, right? So they will just separate and each goes their ways. Second solution. Third solution, and which is interesting. It's an oscillating solutions, right? For infinity. So there's Romeo and Juliet, they can, can quarrel and make love, quarrel, make love for infinity in these mathematical models, which is quite interesting. This is not what I would expect, but this is in the mathematics of the equations. And the same applies for runoff and soil erosion. So uh, the left figure shows a stable solution. So it rains, but there's soil formation and soil erosion, soil formation, but more or less the soil stays stable. But on the right hand side, the parameters are slightly changed, the coefficients, which means there is erosion. But because the dependence is slightly different, there will ultimately, in the long term, there will be a depletion of the soils. And this landscape will turn into badlands, no soil, no vegetation. It collapses. It's like the divorce the separation of Romeo and Juliet, okay? And this has to do with the connections because they're coupled. Ah, thank you very much. Because Romeo and Juliet, they're coupled on the short term and on the long term, okay? Can we move on? What, what next? Okay, then more examples. We don't need to go through that. Okay, let's keep going, please. Uh, these are just examples of models that do exactly the same thing. We don't need that. Ah, okay. Now, you're engineers. You have no problems with writing down the relationship of, between two, two people by differential equation, right? Anybody, any uh, ethical problems? Do you have any problems with conceptualizing the relationship between people by differential equation? Talk to sociologists. They will be really upset. They will say, you cannot force the relationship of people into two variables or four variables. That's not possible. It's just too complex. Well, uh, this has to do with the, with the science culture. 
there are two main sciences dealing with groups of people. One is sociology, how groups of people behave, right? What is the other science? You know it. You definitely know what the other science is. What is the other science that deals with the behavior of groups of people? Psychology. Uh, psychology is the individual people. Groups of people. There's another big, very important science. Some people say the most important science. I don't agree, but... Uh, engineers, to some degree, deal with people. That's true, but less explicit. But there is a group of uh, science that very explicitly deals with the behavior of people. Politics. Politics also, yeah, <laughs> true. Another one? Sociology, I think. Well, this was the first? Philosophers. Wow. <laughs> no. Bio no, not biology, no, 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 biology. Well, they all, they all deal with people in some way, but. Statistics? Uh, no, statistics is part of mathematics. Mathematics is not real, you need to remember. Mathematics is just here in our heads. They also deal with people. Okay, I'll, hmm? That's not real. That's mathematics is not real, no. <laughs> mathematics is not real. You, anybody disagrees that mathematics is not real? It's just here. Mathematics does not exist in reality. It's just in our heads, in our mind. That's why it's so brilliant. We can think of it. Same with philosophy. It does not exist. It's not an empirical science. Huh? Well, it's, it's useful to have mathematics. It's just in our, in our ideas. I'm not saying it's not useful. But it's just in ideas. Okay, I'll give you the solution to the riddle. Economics. Economics deals with people, a lot with people. What people are buying, what people are selling, with the market, which is also people. The expectations of the people, the willingness of buying of the people, the, the price, the equilibrium of demand, and etc. Uh, and the, the, the science history of economics, this economics is a little older than sociology. Economics started in the 19th century, and sociology in the 20th century. But the difference is that econom economists have no problem whatsoever to force the behavior of people into one equation, exactly these equations. And the, the, the previous equation, the one, can you just go up again, uh, please? This one, yeah. This is an economic model by a colleague of mine at my university. She's a mathematical economist. And she forces exactly the behavior of people into this kind of equations. She has no problem whatsoever. So whether we can quantify the behavior of people by simple equations or not has nothing to do with the people or whether it's possible. It's our choice. And there are two schools, economics and sociology, who have made different choice, choices just the way it was. There's no inherent reason for that, right? But it's just we observe sometimes they have, it's like politics, politics evolve sometimes without a reason. It just happened to be this way. Okay, so I ha do not have any problems with using equations because economists do exactly the same. Okay, next equation. Now, what is your idea about decisions? How do people make decisions? This is sociology for engineers, right? <laughs> How do people make this? How do you make decisions? Are you rational? You are rational. Okay. Sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> who, would, uh, who would consider himself or herself a rational person? Okay, I don't ask who is an irrational person, but the, the opposite of being irrational in the decision would be emotional. Okay, I tell you, how I think I work. I don't know how I work, but how I think I work. Because in, in, in this kind of science, reality and perception are always two different layers, right? What is the case and what you think is the case is not the same. Is there a similarity with hydrology? What is the reality and what we think is the case? Is there a similarity in hydrology? What's the similarity? Two layers, reality and what we think is reality. It's called a model in hydrology. A model is what we think is, it's not reality, we think it is, it's a perception. Okay, I, uh, I'm going to tell you how I think I work. 
I usually make an emotional decision. I need this sports car because I need to fit my bicycle in. This is what a friend of mine, he, he bought a Bosch with a like sports car, and I asked him, why are you going to buy the Bosch? Because I need to fit my bicycle in. Not very rational. He wanted a sports car, right? I can understand. He had an emotional decision, and then he rationalized after the fact. It's also, I think, how my decisions work in many cases. And then I can pretend, I can tell everybody, ah, I was very rational, but ah, often it's not the case. This is how I work. And people, of course, work differently. Now, here's the, here's the schematic tells us um, Very good, thank you very much. So, um, in nature, the, left, the, the two left panels are in nature, and the two right panels, no. The two top panels are nature, the two top panels are nature, and the uh, bottom panels are in hydrology's perspective, which is Sivas and mine, about how psychology and sociology works, right? And not all the sociologists would agree with that. You realize that, right? So, in how nature works, if there is a constraint, nature has no possibility to go beyond that constraint. So, for example, if you wanted to fly without an airplane, you can try as hard as you want, gravity is too, too strong, right? You cannot go up. Agree? It's not possible. There are physical laws that cannot be violated. Mass conservation is always there. Cannot be violated. Can people violate laws? Is it possible for people to violate laws? No, no, I mean societal laws, not natural laws. Oh yeah, we can do that. We do this all the time, right? We speed on the road and we violate the laws all the time. So that's one difference. So at the top left, Boundaries are strict within the natural laws, and the, in the bottom left, people have more flexibility. And the two right panels are similar. In nature, there's usually some energy optimality. So things are driven by, mainly by energy. High energy to low energy, and energy dissipates. That is, mechanical energy is transformed to, to, uh, uh, to thermal energy. So there's, it usually works on in an optimum way from an energy perspective, nature. But people do not always work in an optimum way because we're not, our decisions are not always rational. The economists have a term for that. It's called homo economicus, Latin, right? Homo economicus, you know the term. Homo, it's clear what it means, homo economicus. Okay, but we're not always economic. We are sometimes irrational, emotional, which I think is a good thing. I like people that are not always rational. Okay, can we go down? Okay, now there are examples, and I will give more examples in the afternoon, so we don't have to go through that. There are also scales, it's not so important. Uh, uh, what is that? Top, 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 what is that? Ah, can I make it a little bigger, please? Now, this concept of emerging phenomena that's an interesting concept. It's a bit subtle. Emerging phenomena. You have read the paper. Can anybody of you rephrase? It's not easy. Rephrase what an emerging phenomenon is. Emerging phenomenon. An emerging phenomenon. You can. Yeah, no. no sorry. The consumption of the habit of people uh, changing through time. It's an emerging factor because it's not the same. I agree with that, yes. Emerging phenomenon. Anybody else can give me an example of what emerging phenomenon is? Okay. Let's go back to sociology. You have 20 people in this room. Each have their interests and your, you would like to, what you would like for lunch today or whether you go for dinner tonight, your decisions, what car to buy. You all have your own decisions. Now, I allow you to interact. After the interaction, the group outcome will be different from the accumulation of the individual interests. Why is that? 
because of your interactions. You have an emerging process, an emerging phenomenon. The group decision will be different from the sum of the individual decisions. This is the interactions. Okay, when you have a process, for example, in political, political elections, then there's a discussion process in the public, in the newspapers, in the news, TV. And as a result of that, it's not just the individual accumulated. It's different. It can be negative, right? Okay, so at the end of these three days on Friday afternoon, you will assess me. You will say whether I've been a good teacher or a bad teacher, okay? You probably, Mario will probably ask you. Okay. Okay. Then each of you will have an opinion. You will like some things, you will not like other things. That's okay. But then when you, when you are allowed to discuss in the group, probably because you socialize, you listen, and then, ah, what the others say is probably not a bad idea, then there are two possibilities. You will, um, you, you will strengthen one or the other opinion. So somehow the group will find, ah, really lots of good things, and the group will be overwhelmingly positive. More than individuals. Or alternatively, you really don't like my accent, you don't like these things, and then you'll be very negative as a group. This is an emerging outcome, which is different from the individual opinions, an emerging outcome, okay? And we also have lots of emerging outcomes in, um, in, in water science and water management, um, which has, has, a, has a lot to do how parts of the systems interact, how parts of the systems interact. Let me give, uh, let me give an example. Uh, okay, let's start with the first one, here at the top. Collapse of a system, dry out of the RLC to the short-term irrigation and long-term water balance and economy. So the RLC is a, it's a big lake in the former Soviet Union, and it uh, has been, it's complex. If you go into the history of the RLC, it's really complex. But one of the factors has been that the, the Russian army has been using irrigation, well, the irrig water that flows into this RLC has been used for irrigation, so extracted from the stream, and used for irrigate, irrigating crops, cotton, cotton to produce wool, for the uniforms of the Russian soldiers. Right? It's more complex than that. It has to do with all sorts of things and compensation, hydropower, but this is one of the, one of the effects. And at the short term, people thought, well, why not grow crops? So we, our soldiers need uniforms, right? But in the long term, what happened, the, the RLC dried out with all sorts of other complications. Things emerged which we did not foresee. That's why emergency is a subtle comp subtle uh, concept, because things emerge that we individually, subjectively, as a scientist, uh, don't see immediately, which is not obvious to us, but may maybe due to our limited understanding, so it's, it's a relative concept, but it's not just an accumulation, not an accumulation of things, it's something new emerges. Okay. Okay, we can just move on. Emerging concept, emerging things. See, the depletion of the soil in the first, the blue and brown figure, no soil, badlands. New things emerge we don't, didn't think of. Okay, can we, uh, uh, no, uh, no, is there another table maybe? Go up, please, no, up. The same table? Okay, then I, maybe there's no table. I need to tell you something about system science. Anybody knows what systems science is? System science is something very interesting. You probably were not taught what system science, maybe. Systems science, I, I find it really cool. System science, it's a science. What is a system? <laughs> what is a system? A system can be anything, it can be anything. It can be a technical system. A bridge is a system. You know, you build a bridge, then you load it with a train and with wind, right? It's a system. It will respond. There are forcings on it and will, will be have behavior. It's a system. Can you think of other th systems than
technical systems. Of course, we are engineers, we think of a bridge, okay? Can you think of other systems than technical systems? Yes? The solar system. The solar system, yes. There are stars and planets flying around. They interact, they have forces. It's a very simple system, the solar system. Super simple. Oh, we can write down the equations. Kepler did this 300 years ago. Other systems? Political and economical systems. Political economic systems, they're you know, more complex than the solar system. Ecological system, an ecosystem, there are interactions, there are components, people, uh, not uh, people, maybe yeah, people are also part of the ecosystem, but animals eating other animals, and there's a food chain in an ecosystem. Now, system science tries to um, understand systems generally. So, from the behavior, in an, in an abstract, conceptual way. So in, in, instead of uh, accounting for what in each individual bug and earthworm does in the soil, they look at the behavior of the system as a whole. And these equations at the beginning, these couple linear differential equations, are typical equations used by system scientists. And they don't care so much whether it's a political system or ecological system, economic or technical system. Same equation. What's the deal, right? Of course, they, the coefficients will look differently. And the, these are models, these equations. So some models will fit better to the reality than other models. Now, for me, the interesting thing is that there is a lot of similarity between different systems. You right? understand what I'm saying? There's a lot. It's a very interesting thought. Is there a similarity between an ecosystem and the political system, for example. They're different entities. In one case, it's politicians and citizens. In the other case, it's animals and plants, and bacteria, fun fungi. Is there a similarity? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of similarity in terms of the system. The it can evolve, and then it can break down, break, collapse. That's a revolution in the political system. And collapse could be a collapse of an ecosystem. Then animals die out, or politicians die out. Right? There's a lot of similarities. Also similarities with an economic system, also similarities with a technical system, right? This is what system science does. And I find it fascinating that there are system characteristics that are the same across all kinds of systems, social systems, technical systems. Right? One of them is resilience. What is that? What is resilience? What is resilience? Yes? Ah, you were just yawning. Uh, <laughs> it's the ability of a system to return to the original state after uh, a stress. Very good. That's e exactly what I would have said. You have a system, any kind of system, ecological, political, and you put a stress on it. So you have a train on the bridge. And then you remove the train, the bridge goes up again. If the system is not resilient and you put the train on the bridge, it will break and will not go up again. Right, the same with the political economic, that's resilience. Similar characteristics, similar concept for all the different kinds of systems. It's a simple one. Now, and more in, for, for me, even more interesting, so resilience is good, it's important. Um, another system characteristics, which I find is very relevant, is lock-in situations for dynamical systems. Dynamical system means time-dependent. Right, but it could also be space dependent, not time dependent, but we mostly deal with dynamical time dependent system. Lock in situations. It is in the paper. What is a lock in situation? Okay. Okay, I'll give you an example. I'm not sure what, what uh, operating systems are you using on your computer? What operating systems? Microsoft, Windows, Mi Microsoft Windows, okay? Why? Is it the best operating system? No! So why are you using it? Okay, I'll tell you why. Because this is a lock-in situation. This is a system. You and your computers and Microsoft, it's a system. The, it's a lock-in situation that when you follow a path in the 80s, when Microsoft was still small and programming for IBM, it was in the 80s, the PCs, they developed this uh, Windows system. And somehow they managed very cleverly that IBM, 
So they used, really, they used IBM. IBM used this uh, operating system and spread it on lots of PCs uh, around the world because IBM was the market leader at that time in the 80s. And then people got used to it. Okay. Okay, but, but even worse, if you were alone in the world, if I were alone in the world, I would definitely not use Windows. Like there's a dozen of other operating systems that, that are better. But I use it because you are using it. And you are using it because others are using it. And the, what is called the, the transition cost, that's the term, the transition cost is too large. So you could change or changing costs. You could change a different system, but it's expensive, not only monetarily, but time and nuisance. You, you, you get an attachment, you cannot read it, right? Or the, the format is, is shuffled around. So we move into a state using Microsoft Windows, and then we are, at, at initially it was optimum. It was a good decision to use Microsoft Windows. But over the years, the boundary conditions changed, and it's not longer optimum. It's not nearly optimum, but we are stuck in the situation. It's called a lock-in situation. And it's very expensive, expensive in general terms, to change the situations. The changing costs are expensive. That's why you're still using uh, Microsoft Windows, and so am I. Okay? Changing costs. It's a lock-in situation. Do we have lock-in situations in water resources management? All the time, it's a very consistent phenomenon that we are managing water resources in, an, in a way that is not very sustainable, but it's difficult to move out. Because from, if you look at it from a purely technical perspective, it's very easy. <laughs> we always have a solution as engineers, right? But when you take the political system, economic system into account, it's much harder. And we have to. In sociology, that's the idea of sociology. It's not just technical. It's technical plus sociological. An example from the paper. India. Did anybody read the Indian example in the paper? Log in. Sit yes? Can no, you're just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're just showing that you're happy. Okay. Uh, the Indian example. In, in part of India, and I know the situation because my co-author, Siva Siva Palan, he's from Sri Lanka, so he knows the Indian situation very well. One state in India, in the southwest, for political reasons, the politician promised the citizens free electric energy for pumping groundwater. Okay? So a good idea. What happens? The citizens elected them, this, this group of politicians, this party. So they got, get into power, and they lived up to their promise, which is a good thing. <laughs> That's not always the case, but they made electrical energy free for all the citizens uh, and paid it from the government, uh, government uh, funds in order to pump groundwater. What, what happened? Guess. If you pump groundwater all the time to irrigate. Uh, as hydrologists, we know, the groundwater level will drop, which is not a good thing. And just, so they had to pump, use more energy. You know, when the groundwater table is lower, 50 meters below ground, you need much more energy to pump it out. Up. But that's not a problem because energy is free. Let's pump more groundwater and develop the country. Okay. Now the politicians realized, ah, it was a very good idea, so I'm in power, but maybe not such a good idea because groundwater levels are depleting, which is not good for our environment. And they thought, maybe we change it. Do you think they changed it? No. For for technical reasons, very simple. Just introduce the uh, uh, charges to, for the electricity, but for political reasons, not. Because if they were worried about changing it, because the next elections, they would have lost them. Right? This is a lock-in situation. Te for technical reasons, you can move out. But if it's the coupled socio-hydrological system, you're stuck. So they're stuck with this government, and you're stuck with this free electricity. And granted, the levels are dropping, 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 dropping again. This is one example, but you can think of many other examples. Lock-in situations are important. And if we look at it from a systems perspective, systems dynamics perspective, we can see, well, there's a lock-in situation with groundwater, and there's a lock-in situation with other things. You, you can imagine that. Lock-in is very important. But there's also there's collapse and, and, and oscillations, but also other system characteristics. But I like lock-in most. I like lock-in most. It's very, uh, very often the case. Okay. Let's move on. 
Now, this is what's the sort of introduction. Now we are getting, how much time do we have? 10, ten minutes. It's flex. Um, okay. Now, what I, w I did not tell you what I want to achieve in the next five uh, lessons, which I should. A good teacher should say hello, or let's introduce yourself, and then introduce what we want to achieve in the next days. I did not do that, right? But I'm doing that now. What I, want, what I want to achieve from my perspective is for you to get an understanding about this coupling in the systems behavior of sociological processes, first. Second, that you are able to frame your own socio-hydrological problems. Frame. Okay, that's an interesting English word. It doesn't exist in German. I'm not sure about Brazilian. What does it mean, frame? Okay, literally it means you have a picture and you put a frame around it, right? <laughs> literally. Hmm? A draft uh, in, 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 in <coughs> Portuguese could be a uh, mark or schedule, a frame, it's a schedule. It's a, the big picture about your problem. Yeah. Mark. mark is the frame. Okay, so what it means is you have a problem and you want to structure it in a way, you want to structure the problem in a way that you can deal with it in a quantitative way, okay? For some problems, it's easy. You have on a beam, civil engineers, on two supports, you have a load on that beam, and then the beam will lower, and you want to estimate how much it lowers and the strength of the beam. People have done this before us, like 150 years ago or 200 years ago. It's very, we are taught how to frame that, okay? Two supports, one beam. You don't have to consider the thickness of the beam. The beam is just one line. So we can use the linear statics for that. Elasticity theory has been framed for us. Sociohydrological problems are not easy to frame. It's not at all obvious. And there's not one best solution how to frame it. Framing means what are the components of the system? How do they interact? And most importantly, because it's a model, what are the system boundaries? Okay. After the break, I will start with these seven steps. It's a guide to framing socio-hydrological problem. And I will explain this in the next unit for you. And after that, you will frame your problems for me. Okay. I will ask you out to the whiteboard. Think of one Brazilian water problem, could be floods, droughts, water quality, yeah. your problems, not my problems. And then let's go through the steps for your problem. And you will learn not only how to deal with that particular problem, but the procedure, how to think about framing uh, socio-hydrological problems. In, generally, this framing is, uh, is universal, not just socio-ideology. You could also frame other problems, cultural or, you know. But this is, it's, the overall idea is general, but the, the, the focus is socio-ideology, right? Framing. We have a problem, and then we say what are the boundaries, what are the components, what variables do we use, how are the interactions between the variables? How can I test this model and this kind of thing? Okay, I'll give you a homework. How much? How, much, how long is the break? Thirty. Minutes. 30. 30. It's very long. Well, I need to shape the frame in the next unit, but you get the homework for the break. It's a break work, not a homework. Okay. You get a break work, so it's, it's no time to relax. In the break, it's time to think. I would, each, this, this course is about thinking, right? You need to, I would ask you to think about your socio-hydrological problem. So it, in order to qualify for a socio-hydrological problem, it should be real, not made up, right? Real. So when I ask Mario, is this real in Brazil? He can say yes, it's not made up. 
right? We don't want fairy tales, real world problem. You, you need hydrology as part of it. We need some social, economic, political aspect of it. And we need some coupling. Could be floods, droughts, irrigation. Ideally, in a particular location you can think of. In my hometown, where I'm doing my PhD thesis, right? Each of you, please, during the next 30 minutes, think about a socio-hydrological problem, and then uh, you think about that. Then I will explain the overall structure, and after that, we will go through individual problems and frame them. And then at the end of that, not all of your problems, but some of them, you will have the model equations for your problem. Okay? And they will look very different from the models you're used to, hydrological models. They will be very different. Okay? So this is what I would like to achieve with you in the, in the next days. And then we have a, now we have a break for 30 minutes. And we reconvene at what time? Okay, we, re we reconvene here at 10 o'clock and you come prepared with your sociological problem. Thank you. <laughs>